the Indians used a peculiar boat building technology for building ships both for oceanic voyages as well as for internal travel, which involved essentially stitching together the ship. So this is very different from what you would think you would do, which is to nail a ship together on a frame. Now remember, this is not because of the lack of rust-free nails. Indians were very highly advanced in metallurgy, and as you know from the Meroli iron pillar, they actually knew how to make rust-free nails. Much of this is being done by corporatized guilds, very similar to multinational companies. You know, they had these very colorful names as well. One of these corporatized guilds from India was called the 500. These voyages were funded by temple banks. So the reason they had so much gold is that they functioned as banks. Now the stitching technique went into severe decline once the Europeans turned up. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Commander Subir Kumar Singh, Officer in Charge, Naval Construction Wing, IIT Delhi. I take this opportunity to welcome you all for 20th Commodore Garg Memorial Lecture being organized in the memory of late Commodore Ved Prakash Garg. This lecture tries to keep alive the memories of those pioneers in the field of ship design and construction in India, under whose leadership the Naval Architecture Fraternity improved its prowess and sped up the process of re-establishing the tradition of shipbuilding in the country. We are about to commence our event by lighting the lamp of knowledge and wisdom. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and proud privilege to briefly introduce the speaker of the day, Sri Sanjeev Sanyal, member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Sri Sanjeev Sanyal was the principal economic advisor to the Finance Minister for five years till February 2022 and the co-chair of the G20's Framework Working Group. Prior to joining the government, he has spent over two decades in financial markets and was global strategist and managing director at Deutsche Bank. An alumni of Sri Ram College of Commerce, Delhi, Mr. Sanya later attended Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He was awarded the Eisenhower Fellowship in 2007 for his work on urban dynamics. In 2010, he was named as a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in Davos. Mr. Sanya is the author of a number of best-selling books. He has also published over 200 articles and columns in leading national and international publications. Without any further delay, May I now request Sri Sanjeev Sanyal to kindly deliver the talk on ancient ship, a symbol of maritime history of Bharat. Sir. First of all, let me begin by thanking the Indian Navy and IIT Delhi for inviting me to deliver the 20th Commodore Garg Memorial Lecture. As you all know, Commodore Garg was the first uniformed naval architect in the Indian Navy, and I'm sure he would be particularly pleased by the lecture I'm going to deliver about the ancient stitch ship, about how to build one and then to sail one. So just a quick outline of the lecture. It's firstly, you'll have the historical perspective, the aim of the project, overview of the construction of uh, uh, earlier constructions using the stitch ship, an understanding of what, uh, how the stitch ships actually built, the reconstruction of a actual Indian stitch ship, and then the future course that we intend to steer. So a quick historical perspective on what is this stitch ship all about. Now India, as you know, has a very long maritime history going back to the Bronze Age. Whether the Vedic literature or <clears throat> from archaeological finds, we know that the Bronze Age uh, was full of maritime activity. You had ports like Dhulavira in Gujarat, and they were sailing out both along the Indian coast, southward the Konkan coast, as well as westward out to the Persian Gulf area. So this is five, 6,000 years ago. And this tradition of sailing continued into later times. So by the Iron Age, you have ships on both coasts, but particularly on the east coast from what is now West Bengal and Odisha, sailing down south all the way to Sri Lanka on one side along the coast, and on the other side, sailing out towards Southeast Asia. They would sail out to the Isthmus of Kra, which is the bit of Thailand from which Mal Mal the Malay Peninsula hangs off. And then they would go across to the other side and then sail on to the Mekong Delta, in, which is now 
Vietnam and Cambodia and then further on to China and Korea and so on. People don't realize this, but Korean history actually begins by the marriage of a Korean prince to a princess from Ayodhya. So, these, this kind of uh, voyages were already happening, um, you know, from the Bronze Age into the Iron Age. Now, by the first century BC, the uh, Indians realized that you could use the monsoon winds to do two things. One is to go across and come back because the monsoon winds and the currents associated with it, and I will talk about the currents as well. The combination of the two are very interesting because they flow in one direction for part of the year and flow in the exact opposite direction for the rest of the year. So what this allows you to do is to go somewhere and come back. So using the monsoons and the associated currents, the Indian mar mariners began to sail across both to uh, the um, Red Sea uh, all the way up and then um, trade with both the Egyptian side the, and the Greeks and the Romans and basically with the Mediterranean world at large. Uh, they would go across to the Persian Gulf and trade with the Persians and uh, the Mesopotamian empires. And on the other side, they would sail out. By this time, as I said, they were able to cross the oceans directly. So they would sail out to what is now Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore. And from there, further on out towards Japan and China and so on. And of course, <clears throat> they were not just trading. Uh, they were also spreading Indian ideas like Hinduism and Buddhism. They were spreading Indian culture. There was large migration. Both ways, by the way. There were also people from Southeast Asia and, and from Arabia and so on coming to India. And there were occasional naval uh, operations as well, and most famously by the Cholas. So this was quite a lot of economic and geopolitical and cultural activity that was going on. There was also, incidentally, a lot of uh, 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 boat building for internal riverways. So whether the Indus or the Gangetic system, uh, many, there was a significant amount of uh, uh, in, inland uh, waterways being also sailed. Now, what is interesting, of course, about all of this is that the Indians used a peculiar boat building technology for building ships, both for oceanic voyages as well as for internal uh, um, travel, which involved essentially stitching together the ship. So this is very different from what you would think you would do, which is to nail a ship together on a frame. Instead, they stitched the planks together using a peculiar technique. Now remember, this is not because of the lack of rust-free nails. Indians were very highly advanced in metallurgy, and as you know from the Meroli uh, iron pillar, they actually knew how to make rust-free nails. So it wasn't because we didn't know how to make rust-free nails that we were stitching it together. And it's a bit of a mystery, which we hope to solve as, uh, through this project, about exactly why they preferred to continue to use this uh, stitched technique for uh, putting a ship together. Now, I've got two images on the screen. Uh, they are both of uh, uh, river uh, boats, but the reason I have used them here is because in both cases you can see uh, that the uh, planking is very clear. You can see that the, if you look at the hull, it, it, it clearly shows that it is stitched together. One is from the Jagannath temple in Puri, and the other is a representation somewhat later of, of the uh, Babar Nama. Both of all, you can see that the planking is stitched together. So that's why I used it here, although my talk is about ocean-going ships. Now, several ancient ships mention the maritime activity. So, so your maritime activity is even mentioned in the Vedas, going back 4,000 years uh, or, or, or 6,000 years, who knows when, when those were put together. But even in later texts, you hear a lot about maritime activity, and specifically you have mention of boat building. And one of the texts which does that is the Yukti Kalpaturu, which was put together or written personally by Raja Bhoj about the 10th, 11th century. Now, this um, document mentions uh, a lot of classifications of different kinds of ships that were being built. 
And he also mentions that these ships should be preferably stitched together. So it's not like Indians didn't know about nail ships. They were obviously dealing with other cultures that were building nail ships. And they were also building some themselves. But the Yukti Kalpataru clearly mentions that the preference should be given to uh, building ships by stitching them together. It also gives classifications of Samanya ships, which were uh, ordinary ships, which were probably the bulk of the ship built ships. And these ships were somewhat broader than the others. So these were used for both maritime activity and for river. And the ratio, there was a peculiar ratio that they used, that the length was four times the breadth. And then there were various classifications how big they were. So some were much bigger than the others. But the ratio was always one is to four. And then there were Vishesha ships or special specialized ships, which had a ratio of one is to eight. So they were quite long, narrow ships, which would obviously make them capable of much faster um, uh, travel. But of course, we can discuss the stability characteristics of this. Maybe they used outriggers, we don't know. But they were obviously for specialist uh, operations. And most of these Vishesha ships were for ocean-going activities. We also know that they had different kinds of cabin structures internally. So the internal structure was also diff different. So we know, for example, that there were ships which had cabins extending the entire length. Then you had the Madhya Mandira, which had cabins extending in, uh, which only in the middle, and the Agra Mandira, which were the cabins only, which were forward. So according to the cabin structure also, there was classification. And then again, for the Vishesha ships, there were uh, 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 classifications by size. I'm just, I just have the Vishesha ones here, just so that you know. And these lengths are in cubits. Cubits are, I think, about 0.45 centimeters, so a little less than a, 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 a meter. But you can see that these ships are not small ships. The very biggest ship, uh, as you can see, uh, the Begini, uh, would be uh, 176 cubit, which is like, uh, you know, uh, not a trivial uh, size, uh, almost 80 meters size. And then, as I said, there is the 1 is to um, 8 ratio. So the breadth was only 10 min meters. So it's a very narrow, long uh, ship. Um, they, these were specialized ships. We don't know exactly. Unfortunately, the Yukti Kalparutaru doesn't tell you exactly what the use of these ships were. It also tells you the height uh, of the ship of the hull. So this is not of the, of the mast, which were much, much higher. Now, there are foreign travelers also who tell you about these uh, Indian ships. And going back to the first century Ptolemy, he says that Indian shipbuilders built a fleet of 2,000 ships. And each of them, and this is perhaps an exaggerated, and perhaps not each of them, but certainly there were certain some ships which were capable of accommodating a 1,000 troops. Now, this is important because it suggests also naval activity. And they could bring a thousand troops, horses, and a vast quantity of supplies. So a single ship could bring a thousand troops. That's a non-trivial size ship. Even by modern standard, that's a non-trivial ship. Then there's Marco Polo by the 1300s. And he's talking about ships that were so large that they had a crew of 150 to 300 men. And it was propelled both by oars and sails, and it had multiple decks. And there were over 60 cabins for merchants. So these are, again, not trivial-sized ships. And there were cargo holds and so on. And the ship was <coughs> divided by bulkheads. Again, going back to the previous, uh, it corroborates what we heard in the previous uh, slide in the Yukti Kalpataru, that there were all these cabins and bulkheads. But interestingly, he mentions that many of these ships were fastened by iron nails. So I'm mentioning this that the iron nail technique was also alive, it, and some people preferred that. And then there's Niccolo Conti, who comes about 100 years later, and he says that there were ships weighing about 1,000 tons and had five sails. So again, I'm repeating all of this so that you understand that these are not, you know, small amateur products. These are serious ships. And then you have another half a century later, Santo Stefano, who comes and says, the timbers of the ships were stitched together with cords and sails made of cotton. So you can also hear about the stitch ship technique was still alive uh, just at the eve of the Europeans turning out. So these were the large ships uh, doing these uh, transcontinental uh, voyages. 
And I want to also say, although it's not to do with the sh ship technology itself, but do remember that much of this is not being done by, you know, individual merchants or mariners, you know, single-handedly single crossing the oceans. Much of this is being done by corporatized guilds. We are very similar to multinational companies. You know, they had these very colorful names as well. One of these corporatized guilds from India was called the 500, which means that they had 500 uh, shareholders. And they lasted hundreds of years. They had their own navy. And they would very often uh, survive over many dynasties, suggesting that, uh, you know, the kings usually didn't mess with them because they were obviously quite powerful. And the other interesting thing is that these voyages were funded by temple banks. So very often you may wonder why Indian temples in medieval period had so much gold. Uh, you may get the impression sometimes that that's because the kings were handing over their gold to the temples. That is not the case. Uh, getting Indian politicians to hand over their money to anyone was difficult even at that time. So the reason they had so much gold is that they functioned as banks. And many of these voyages were funded by the, the venture capital and the loans were given by these temples. And this is why they had such a lot of gold. We in fact have tripartite agreements uh, in copper plate and also inscriptions uh, which show how these uh, uh, voyages were done and how uh, these merchant guilds, the artisan guilds and the uh, temple banks would have uh, contracts with each other about these uh, carrying out this trade. So what did these stitch ships look like? So obviously we are dealing with a very long period of time. They look different at different points in time. And as I said, they were both stitched in nails. Although contemporary texts, including the Yukti Kalpataru, make it very clear that the stitching technique was preferred. Now, the reason, as I said, of this preference is not known. One possibility is that this stitching technique meant that the hull was a little bit flexible. And remember the nature of the Indian Ocean. The nature of the Indian Ocean is, first of all, you had to sail with the wind, which meant that you sailed when the seas were at their roughest, particularly the incoming voyage would be when the sail, sea was at its roughest. And you would have to sail through waters which have lots of reefs and shoals and so on, uh, particularly the Maldives, the Lakshadweep and so on, which meant that you had to be very, very careful and getting stuck in a shoal or sandbar or reef was a non-trivial danger. And one of the advantages of having a somewhat flexible hull is that when you crash into one of these things, maybe you will develop some leaks, but the ship will not simply break up and collapse. And so, we are guessing that one possible reason why there was this preference for these ships was because these flexible hulls were um, easier to repair. So, you know, if you happen to be uh, stuck on Bangaram Island in Lakshadweep, then you could dra drag it in and repair it and ho have a hope of sailing out again. Whereas with a nailed ship, it would just fall apart. Now, the stitching technique went into severe decline once the Europeans turned up uh, in the end of the 15th century, but really in the 16th century with the Portuguese. Because the Europeans had one big advantage over Indian shipbuilding, and that had the use of cannons. It's not like the Indians couldn't adopt cannons very quickly. The problem was that a stitch ship could not take the blowback from its own cannons. So if you use cannons, the blowback would, would begin to loosen the stitching, and you would develop leaks. So you had to shift on to nailed technique. And so by the time the Marathas in the 18th century were building out their navy, they also had to adopt the nailed technique. And so the stitching technique went into rapid decline till there are just a tiny number of uh, communities today who still use the stitching technique. But as you will see, they use it only for building very small fishing vessels for coastal fishing. So the question is, what did these ancient ships look like? We have several depictions of them. Here is one from the 5th, 4th, 5th century from Ajanta. It's a painting from cave number 2. Please look at it carefully because this is one of the main ships on which we have based the ship that we are trying to build. You can see it has got three main masts that has a four sail mast as well. If you can see, 
on the extreme uh, right, uh, where there's a person, one of the merchants standing, you can also see these vats of water. So they had to carry water with them, and you can see that as well. Also notice that it doesn't have a rudder. It has a trailing oar. So a trailing oar was used for uh, as a rudder. Uh, it didn't have the rudder that we are usually used to. Now, this technique of stitching sort of survives in a tiny number of communities, but it's very rapidly disappearing because we're all moving into modern ships, fiberglass, etc., even for small ships. But you can see on the top right-hand corner some of the stitching technique as it looks in real life. So since we were talking about stitching, this is what the stitching technique looks like. And this is, this is the kinds of boats that have uh, survived in the Karnataka coast, but you get it on both coasts. So what is the aim of this stitch ship project? Well, one is just a reconstruction of a large ocean-going ship. As I said, for many generations, we haven't built a large ship using this technique. So we don't know, uh, of course, we're building these, we're still building these small ships, but what would it be to build a large ship using a Indian uh, uh, stitch ship technique? And we are specifically trying to attempt to build a ship from the fourth, fifth century, the Gupta period. So that, uh, you know, so as I said, we, this technique was used over very long periods of time. So we, were, we are being specific about the particular period from which we are trying to uh, build a ship. Obviously, it will revive the cultural memories of India's glorious in maritime history. It will also allow us to understand the use of monsoons and equatorial currents uh, for, uh, you know, how uh, ancient uh, interactions across the Indian Ocean uh, worked. Uh, obviously, today we use motorized ships, so very often we don't pay too much attention to the winds and to the currents. Uh, but it would be uh, an important thing to note that both the currents and the winds were absolutely critical to understanding uh, Indian history, uh, both in terms of trade, uh, but also in terms of flow of Indian culture, technologies, also geopolitical rivalries of the past. Obviously, we want to do this to inculcate a sense of pride in Indian maritime heritage. And then, importantly, we want to use this ship to undertake a voyage using some of these ancient routes. Now, we are not the only country that has attempted to build uh, stitching uh, 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 stitch ships. Uh, the Omani have been very much uh, involved in trying to use this technology. Their own ships used to be stitched. Importantly, the Arabs, during the height of the Arab uh, dominance of the Indian Ocean, they used to use stitch ship, but most of these stitch ships were interestingly built in India. Because remember, they don't have the lumber. So they don't have the timber, so they had to build these ships on our side. And in fact, uh, some of these ships, uh, the most recent of which uh, they're building, the Jewel of Muscat, uh, was also built by Indian shipwrights. It was built in Oman, but by Indian shipbuilders led, led by a gentleman called Babu Sankaran, uh, who will also be helping us build our ship. He's uh, from Kerala, from uh, the Beipur area, and his team will be also helping us build the ship. But there were earlier attempts, the Sohar, the Egyptus, there's a more recent one, Al Hariri, although that is not being sailed, that is more for museum. But the reason, the, the reason I'm showing you this is so that you know that other countries have celebrated their maritime uh, techniques, uh, but it's the first time that we in India are going to do this. So understanding the Indian art of stitch ships so that you know what is used for stitching it together. It is coir ropes. This is the, what is used for stitching it together. It's slightly different from the ones that you may buy in the market. It's stronger, thicker, uh, and higher quality, but it's still basically coir rope. Then there was coconut fiber, which is also coir, basically, to do the fillers between the joints. Because remember, what we are doing is, since we are not nailing it together to the frame, but building the uh, hull first, so there are all these joints that are being stitched, there are gaps, they have to be filled out. Obviously, you need needles. And then there is the kudrus re resin. This is absolutely critical, because this is the resin, and <clears throat> we have some examples of it. On the picture, you have the resin. Uh, the natural form of the resin. And this is absolutely critical because once it has been it, it, it put through together as gum and put into the, the, the gaps, etc., it then hardens uh, so that these gaps and holes and other things that are created as part of the, the shipbuilding get uh, filled out.
So this is the natural gum that is used between the joints and for uh, the holes. Then there is fish oil and limestone powder that are used on the outside to, in order to uh, improve the uh, durability of the wood and to again give it some durability. And then there is red brick pigment uh, which is used for the external hull. It also in improves durability. So this is the materials used for doing this. So what is the first step in building this? Uh, the first step is essentially building the keel. And just uh, two months ago, we laid the keel of the new ship that we are building in a uh, in uh, Hodi, which is in Dewar Island um, in, uh, in Goa, where we are, uh, where the first step is being done. And the keel is ideally sourced from a single piece of lump uh, for of timber. But uh, obviously, if it's a very large ship, you may need two or even more uh, of them. And they are, that's the first step. And then what happens is that the planks are taken and they are put in these chambers for steaming. So why are you steam? Basically, it loosens out the fibers of the wood so that it can be shaped uh, and slightly curved for the purposes of uh, building the hull. And then once they have been steamed in these chambers, they are removed and then they are shaped. And once they have, and they have to be done very quickly before they, they go back, uh, they lose the looseness. But repeatedly, but you have to not just do it once, repeatedly you have to do it till the correct shape is achieved. And again, uh, it's shown here how that works. Then the outer shell, the hull of the, is created. So you have pairs of holes are drilled along the two planks, as you can see on the very first picture. And then coconut fiber is laid and wadded. So this is very important that there is a wadding. It's not just the stitching, but it's there is a wadding that is put using coconut fiber that's laid over the joints of the planks, which is then layered with coconut rope. So this is an important part of the process of doing it. One important thing that I would like to also mention here that there were other cultures who also did stitch ships. So for example, uh, the Indonesians also had a stitch ship technique. Uh, if you go to Indonesia and go to Borobudur, you will see one of them uh, depicted on, uh, in Borobudur. And in their technique, uh, along the edges of the uh, planks, they would also put these small holes and put pegs, and they would put it together. If you have ever done IKEA furniture, uh, then you will know how that works. Now, that is another way of doing it. So they, they also stitched it, but it was not the stitching, but the pegs that provided most of the structure. But for some reason, we preferred it this way. Then you have the stitching is done. Now, for doing this, one important thing to remember is that the stitching is not just back and forth. It is done in this IIXII pattern, um, which if you look at the extreme right, you can see you know, how that IIXII pattern of stitching is done. And then the Kudrus resin is being applied along between the planks to uh, give the waterproofing. It's also done all along uh, between the holes and so on. And then, after having built the outer shell, that's when the frame is put in. So this is, as I said, completely different from how you may think modern ships are built. You first build a frame and then put the uh, uh, plank, uh, the, the the shell. Here, the shell is built and then the 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 frame is fitted in retrospectively. Uh, again, the stem post and the stern post uh, uh, are also put at both ends uh, and are stitched to the keel. And then so the horizontal cross beams are also stitched together. So that's basically what gives it some deg degree of shape and stability. Then, of course, not surprisingly, given that you have stuck so many holes in the outer shell, you have to waterproof it. And so the stitching and the holes are filled with plugs. Uh, putty is applied. Again, the kudru's gum is used extensively. And then the uh, coat, coating of the fish oil inside and outside of the hull is also used. Now, since I intend to sail this ship, I'm rather concerned about the smell that is likely to come from this fish oil that's applied everywhere. Now, reconstruction of the ship. Now, this project was something that I had dreamt of maybe a de decade ago when I was writing my book, The Ocean of Churn, which some of you may have also read. And I hoped that just like many other countries celebrate their maritime uh, history by building and reconstructing ancient ships. For example, the Scandinavians have repeatedly built Viking ships. 
Um, others, other Europeans have built ships from their period of, uh, you know, maritime um, uh, expansion. Um, the Omanis, as you saw, are doing so. So, you know, I thought, you know, we Indians should also do it, given our amazing history, one of possibly the longest history of any country of maritime activity. So it's an idea that I put forward to the Honorable Prime Minister and to Culture Ministry, and they were very supportive. So with the fun funding of uh, the Culture Ministry, uh, we now have a project where the Ministry of Defense and the Indian Navy are basically going to oversee and then later on crew uh, this building of this ship. Uh, it's being built, as I said, at um, uh, Hodi Shipbuilders. It's a dock that they have in Diwar Island in Goa. And the team of Babu Sankaran uh, uh, is going to um, uh, do this. As I said, they have already an experience of building the uh, uh, ship for Oman, so they should be able to help us with this. And of course, we have, we will have the support of the Ministry of External Affairs for foreign co uh, cooperation when we do these voyages, and of the Ministry of Shipping for various regulatory approvals. So now comes the issue of designing this ship. You will remember the ship I showed you from Ajanta. Here is a sort of schematic drawing of that ship. Uh, it's from the 4th, 5th century. It's an ocean-going ship. We know that. There are no oars along the edge, so that's quite obvious. Um, there are other depictions as well, which we have used. Um, there are surviving boat-building traditions that have had that are there. Uh, there are obviously the Omani reconstructions. And of course, we have done a lot of in-house research on te ancient texts, etc., including the Yukti Kaudpataru. And you can see this sort of sketch over there. What does such a ship would have looked like? Uh, it has three masts in the middle, and it has a four sail as well. Uh, and as I said, it uses these two trailing oars to do the uh, uh, ruddering. It doesn't have a rudder as we know it today. So we have converted this into a concept design. So this is the ship we are actually going to build. Uh, given the sort of size and scale, we, we have reduced the number of masts to two because that would allow more space for walking around and so on. Uh, it was just getting too cluttered. It'll have two main masts, and then we will retain the foresail. Uh, you can see how it looks from both the top and from the front. We have retained also the trailing oar. Now, this is something that we will have to really experiment with when we are testing the ship, because we actually don't know the um, sort of uh, sailing characteristics of a trailing oar as the rudder rather than the rudder, the type of rudders we use, the central uh, single rudder that we have got used to using in modern times. Importantly, we will also be using square sails, not lanteen sails. Again, the triangular lanteen sails that are very often used today for most sailing, uh, that has major advantage in that you can sail at a certain angle to the wind. Um, we now Lanteen sails, by the way, are also ancient and are very likely an Indian invention. So it would not have been wrong to use a lanteen sail in, in our reconstruction. But we are using a ship from a period where these lanteen sails were clearly not used. We are, so we have to be true to the period. And since they were seem to be using square sails, we will be using square sails. Square sails do rather well if you're sailing with the wind because uh, it has, you know, it's a square, large uh, surface area. But then if you have to sail at a, some angle to the wind, it causes, uh, uh, it's less efficient. So what are the principal dimensions of the ship? So the length we are attempting is uh, 21 meters. Uh, the breadth is uh, 6.5 meters. So we are not quite uh, go uh, going with the, the dimensions of that then the Yukti Kalpataru. Then the depth of 4 meters and the propulsion will be, as I said, two main sails and one foresail, all square, square uh, size. And the crew will be one captain plus 12. This is the development of the line plans. Uh, some of you are from uh, uh, this field, so I thought I shall include it so that you have some idea of the plan view, the profile view, and the body plan view. Now comes the issue about what is the efficiency of sailing such a ship. And so, as you all know, there are all kinds of pressures and uh, frictions and other things that, uh, that uh, a ship uh, of, this, of any kind uh, faces. 
So there you have on the zone uh, one, that's the potential flow, that's all the pressures that come in from the waves and other uh, wider uh, movements of water. Then there is the zone two, which is the thin boundary layer, that's the immediate skin friction of the ship uh, that's, happening ag again, uh, 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 that's happening against the hull of the fluid movement. Then there is zone three, which is the viscous flow, which is happening, the wake, the viscous pressures, resistance, and so on. So these are the kinds of things that we need to think about when we are designing the ship and trying to get a sense of what is its uh, efficiency. In order to understand this, again, those of you from uh, this uh, naval architecture background will be very familiar with the Navier-Stokes equations. The Navier-Stokes equations basically they deal with the f fluid flow around the ship's hull, which are represented here by both the conservation of mass and the momentum equations. The basic idea here is to get a sense of <coughs> the, uh, you know, the sense of the viscous forces, the body forces, the pressure forces that this ship's hull will face, particularly given that it is a kind of hull that we are not usually used to. So we had to model this. So here is the fluid ship interaction. I won't get into the details, but basically we want a sense of the forces on the hull. And remember, there are six directions in which these forces are applying. There's the forward, backward direction. There's a sideways direction. And there's the up and down direction. Those are the three linear directions. And then there are the rotational directions, also the equivalent in six, three different directions. So there are the six forces. And then we have the viscous force, which is the fictional drag. You have the pressure force, which is the form drag, the forces due to the ship's motion, forces due to the wa uh, wave excitation. And then there's the hydrostatic or body forces, gravity, and so on. So using these Navier-Stokes equations, we have done a 3D uh, 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 model of the hull form. Um, so this is just to, so that you get a sense of that, what the hull form looks like. And then this is then, uh, the, these equations are then uh, applied to this form using the computational flu fluid dynamics modeling. Many of you, again, are maybe very familiar with this, all of this. And then these Navier-Stokes equations are solved, not just for the whole, but actually by meshing, you do it for every little bit. The reason is that the eddies and so on that happens at different points is quite different. And it's really about getting the intricacy through meshing of every little bit. Thank God for computers attempting to do this uh, bit by bit uh, manually would have driven people crazy. But thanks to computers, you can do it at a fair amount of uh, detailing. Now, <clears throat> there is one issue which I will come to um, that, remember, we are still doing this modeling with smooth hulls. In the ship that we are building, there will be all these stitches. And trying to model the friction and, stitch, uh, and uh, eddies and other things that are created by this stitching uh, that is a really difficult thing to do. So, you know, so this is something that I will come back to in shortly and why uh, the limitations of trying to model this completely on a computer. But nevertheless, we are doing this. And so then we get the free surface wave pattern for this. This is a very basic, just so that we have something to start with. And so we get a sense of this and you get the streamlines and the resistance simulation. But as I said, we need to be very clear that the surface of the hull that we are simulating is smooth. And this is very different from the roughness that we are going to get because of all the external stitches that we are going to use. And of course, remember, even the planks are not exactly entirely smooth. That would have with, say, a metal or any other kind of or fiberglass uh, surface. This is wooden and, you know, even after all the polishing and smoothening, it will have some, some uh, you know, um, intricacies. And of course, the eddies generated by these external stitches, it's not just the friction, but the exter eddies that will be created also have to be captured. So in the end, you have to do it the hard way. You have to take them and create a hull which has the stitching, and then you have to test it uh, through hydrodynamic testing in a towing tank. So we have to build a model and you have to do it. We will do one uh, through in a wave basin, which I think uh, IIT Madras has one of these towing tanks, so we were going to test it there. I think in December or January we will be doing this. And it would be quite interesting to compare what we get from the results from this with the Navier-Stokes results we had from the thing. So that one of the things we are attempting to do is simply to see uh, as an experiment what the modeling differences with the 
tow tank numbers. But of course, ultimately, the proof of the pudding is ultimately in sailing it in. We would be eventually like to compare it with the actual sailing experience. So what is the future course to steer? Well, we are hoping uh, that the launching of the ship will ha happen in end of 2024. Uh, we have used these images. These are not, not the state of the ship as it stands. Right now, only the hull is there. These we have taken from the Jewel of Muscat. But since the same team built it, so it will probably follow a roughly the same uh, approach. The ship itself will look different. Uh, but we are hoping that in uh, end 2024, we'll be able to launch the ship. And then there'll be outfitting by early 2025. We'll be, you know, outfit this with, with all the cabins and uh, other things. And then there will have to be a period of testing. As I said, we do not know quite the, exactly the sailing characteristics of a ship with this flexible hull uh, stitched in this particular way, uh, the use of square uh, sails, and the interaction of all of these things with the trailing rudder that we are, or trailing oar rudder that we are hoping to use. And then so there will be sea trials by mid 2025. And then the idea is that in in 2025, particularly in hopefully in November of 2025, when there is a major festival that is celebrated along the coast, particularly in the state of Odisha, <coughs> relating to ancient voyages called Bali Yatra, and Karth, which is done on the date of Kartik Purnima. So what happens at this festival of Kartik Purnima is that families, usually the women of the family, go out to a water body and they put a small paper boat or a banana, uh, uh, may, or made from banana stems, and they put a lamp and they put it in the water body. And this has been going on for th uh, thousands of years. And what they're effectively doing is enacting the date on which the men folk, the sadhava sailors, would sail out. So what basically you're enacting is the, the children and the women are going out and saying goodbye to the men folk as they set sail for distant lands. And during that time, there is also a fair that is held in Katak called Bali Jatra, which literally means the voyage to Bali. So effectively, what they are enacting is saying goodbye to the sailors who are heading off to Indonesia. Now, why do they do it in Kartik Purnima and not any other time? Well, they do it because of the winds, and I will come to that. But because this is the time when the wind stops say, uh, blowing from south to north, which happens during the monsoons, and switch to blowing from north to south, which is what you would need if you were heading southward. So we have two possible routes that we could use for sailing this. One is, of course, the Gujarat to Oman route, which is, of course, a very ancient route going back all the way to the Harappan period. And then there's the other somewhat longer route, which is the Bali Jatra route, which uh, is important to remember that even after working out the uh, monsoon winds, the, the route to Indonesia was not directly across the Bay of Bengal. The reason for that is obvious. If you use a square sail, you have to sail with the wind. And the wind is blowing from northeast to southwest, right? So you have no option but to sail downwards. If you were setting off from Bengal, Odisha area, you had no option but to sail essentially towards Sri Lanka. And along the coast, they would stop in, 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 in places like Nagapatnam, for example, uh, <clears throat> which is on the Tamil coast. And then they will go on to Trincobali, which is near the Sri in Sri Lanka. And they would refuel, pick up water, etc. Now, after reaching there, interestingly, they would go across to northern Sumatra. How would they do that? They would do that because they were using the cross-oceanic currents. And this is important. The current is a very important part of this. You can sail down all the way, but if you have to cross, you actually have to use the current. It's not the wind that is used. And then once you reach the other side, you then use the local uh, wind patterns to sail your way through to all the way to Bali. So the, the one on the right is the longer journey that one could do. So here are the wind patterns, as you know, south to north in the monsoons and the opposite direction uh, in the winter. And the winter patterns is what you want to use. It's 10 to 15 knots, which is 18 to 27 kilometers per hour. So that, but it's mostly steady, although you do get occasional 
storms and cyclones and so on. So, one has to be a little careful, but on a good day, you should be able to do uh, about 20, 25 kilometers of wind, which will help you along your way. And as I said, there are the surface current vectors, which are absolutely critical. And what is interesting about the Indian Ocean is that just like you have the wind patterns, uh, one direction and the other direction, the same thing happens with the currents. So, because the Indian Ocean has, is, is in some ways a very interesting ocean. It is very different from the Pacific or the Atlantic in that <clears throat> the, the, the no, there is no northern half, the, the northern hemisphere part of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Indian Ocean is very limited. It's mostly a southern hemisphere ocean. So, when the winds blow, they blow the water into the land and then the, 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 the water, obviously, conservation of mass means that they get flipped into a particular pattern and when the wind turns, it flips it into the other pattern. So, when you sail downward using in winter, you will come to the Nagapattam, Sri Lanka area and all you have to do is go a little bit south from there and you can use the current to cross across. So, that is an important thing and in fact, traditionally, uh, the saying was that the Cholas would sail the Indian Ocean uh, by watching how the turtle migration would happen using these currents. So, so it's not just human beings, but also nature that uses these currents for ma mass migration. And the current speed again uh, can be, uh, it's much, much slower uh, as you can uh, tell, but it is steady and uh, can go. There is also the wave heights that we have to look at. There's 1.2 to 2.4 meters. Uh, of course, uh, it changes dramatically if you happen to have a cyclone of some sort. Now comes the building of the replica. As you can see, a replica has been attempted. And this is a first cut glimpse of what this ship would look like when we have, we have already built this replica. This is not the one that we'll use in the towing tank though. That will have to have the stitching. This one doesn't have the stitching. But this gives you an idea of what this ship that we are attempting to build will actually look like. So here we are at the beginning of a long journey. Uh, and I hope you got a sense of uh, what we are attempting to do by replicating this uh, uh, ancient shipping technique to uh, build a ship from around about the 4th, 5th century AD. And most importantly, to then uh, sail it on one of these ancient sailing routes. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Abhidosh Tripathi. Uh, I used to work for TC Research. Uh, given the dating of Ramayana and the questionability around it, we can simply assume that it is older than Indus Valley. And given that you mentioned that uh, Indus Valley was Bronze Age, iron nails were not possible, at least this opens the possibility that in Ramayana period, people could have sailed using stitch shipped to uh, uh, even places across Pacific Ocean. So, as I said, uh, it's very difficult for me to get involved in this uh, discussion because that would divert from uh, what I was attempting to do. But my own sense is that while the Ramayana does mention many things, we shouldn't take it too literally. Because in some ways, it diverts from many of the interesting things that are there in the Ramayana. So, rather than get into a debate about the uh, exact dating of the Ramayana, and remember, the Ramayana has gone through many additions and subtractions along the way. So, trying to work out a specific technology using the Ramayana is very, very difficult to do. Uh, I would much rather uh, not attempt to try and posit uh, on something like a great voyage using the Ramayana because there's just not enough details to be able to guess it. And we can't also guess whether it was later added or not. And certainly, I at least from my reading do not think that there was any uh, a voyage to the extent of across the Pacific. I, I would be very surprised by that. But there is adequate information in the Ramayana on many other interesting things. There is a known voyage of Kontiki, which was done by the famous Norwegian uh, navigator Thor Hadadil. And he did it using uh, the Stone Age technology of balsa wood. And he was able to sail across Pacific Ocean way back in 1950s, early 50s, if I'm not mistaken. 
and then he similarly used uh, so question is not whether it was possible maybe it was possible yeah. first of that but that is not the relevant point question is does this uh, there's this reference to a long voyage we know that from ancient times and certainly during harappan uh, harappan times vedic times if vedic times are before the ramayan so by vedic times were certainly uh, long voyages were being done and we know they were sailing to many places there are references so the question is your point is did they get to somewhere in the pacific well the evidence doesn't is not strong enough to make any uh, any such inference after all there is also inference of pushpak viman that doesn't mean that the the ramayan suggests that we were flying around uh, had aircraft so you know one has to be little careful when when is doing research of this kind one has to be at the very least quite conservative uh, there are some part of the ramayan that do uh, reflect genuine technologies of that time some of it are flights of fantasy so we it's difficult to divide between them also remember that the version of the ramayan that we have today has many later additions including the the last part which the uttar ramayan is also entirely later addition so it is very difficult to know exactly what was happening in the original valmiki version in the end of the bronze age and early iron age the transition when the ramayan was the period to which ramayan refers to what was going on at that time it's very difficult for us to work out so you mentioned that when the uh, when the europeans started using ships i mean started uh, their voyages uh, the stitch ships fell fell out of favor because of the recoil so i would also imagine motorized uh, uh, maneuver also might have uh, been a challenge to these kind of ships because of vibrations and things like that well by the time motorized uh, thing came in the 20th century that's much much later okay, that's much the, this uh, use of this technique to build very large ships has already gone into disuse okay remember even in the 18th century the marathas built a navy uh, and they were using uh, mostly uh nailed ships for their larger vessels so this technique had gone into severe decline by the 20th century the odd ship the dhaus etc may have been built but yeah i mean by the time you know common use of motorization has happened this technique was anyway not widely used so the question i have is yeah uh, do you see some aspect of stitch ships being relevant to today's applications or uh, so are, are, are you exploring such a thing no i'm not exploring such a thing though i'm first uh, attempt is simply to recreate an ancient uh, ship however it is possible that we may find something interesting about uh, a flexibility of a hull and that you know when we do these tests or even sail it we will discover that a flexible hull does provide certain advantages which we did not anticipate in which case of course we now have modern uh, materials that could recreate a flexibility of a hull say with using some kind of fiber glass or something uh, which we don't need to have those stitches which obviously are inefficient because we're having stitches they add to friction so in which case we will use it but that is not the first order uh, reason why we are doing this okay. this is not an attempt to re reintroduce stitch ships this is more a uh, historical exploration but it's also a part of an adventure uh, to try and see how our ancient ancestors used to sail but yes if as a course of the doing this we discover something yeah that's could be great thank you uh, i am kavadot vinith tiwari a veteran uh, looking at uh, the you know the dimensions of the ship you know as you may indicate it 21 meter by 6.5 meter so it appears to be a very very fat ship you know uh it's just around 3.2 meter length to beam ratio so i'm i'm not sure whether these parameters are already finalized or you know they will get finalized after your model testing but it will have a very very poor directional stability you know it being a fat ship so a lot of energy will go in you know always uh, keeping it on a course so i feel uh, you know that unless it is dictated by the layout of the ship that you need to have a very fat ship i feel you know we should uh, so for uh, doing this we did uh, use the experience of the jewel of muscat okay and babu sankran who's built that ship yes he came up with this these ratios okay but again, you are absolutely right this is actually much fatter 
Yes. Then what is uh, directed by the Yukti Kalpataru, which is 1 is to 4. Yes. Uh, and of course, they had specialized sip where the 1 is to 8, where of course, they would have the opposite problem of stability, uh, lateral stability. Yes. So, uh, we have come across these and uh, I have Hemant here who is helping me with this. So, he, he, I'm sure he'll be able to give you some sense of the actual, why we came to this. Uh, so, these are only the indicative dimensions if we've okay. just developed the lines plan. We'll be further refining them, sir, okay. uh, before we take it to the model testing. So, you're right, sir, that okay. we're working on the draft, as uh, this yeah. breadth aspect of it. Yeah. It is a fatter vessel and it will be difficult. Yeah, and, 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 and naval architecture, you always go by some, you know, past experience, previous ship. Okay. Unless that musket ship is already built and sailed and you have some, you know, firm information from that, then you can follow that. Okay. You know, just because somebody is building that ship cannot become a, you know, guiding force for you. Yes. We just, so just, just, just as a, a word, parent uh, ship, yes. Just a word of... Uh, we, are, we are going to test this. That is hence the, all the towing uh, tank and all of that. That's why we are doing all of this. So, yeah, one advantage of this ship is that it actually, the, the dimensions come together over time. Yeah. Uh, it's in a frame, it's already set. Okay. Here you are, we are spending most of the initial phase, which we are now doing is actually just steaming the planks and shaping them. So, <laughs> you know, we, we have some way to, we have fair amount of uh, space to change some of these things. We are going by the ratios that we are talking about. Uh, and since we are trying to recreate uh, a wonderful period of, uh, you know, legacy, it certainly would have been uh, much more authentic if your length to beam ratio would have been between 4 and 8. And we have got enough examples of very successful ships between the length to beam ratio of 4 to 8. So, I'm actually surprised why you are still under 4. We will definitely explore this particular issue. I have a different question. Uh, what uh, prompted or motivated Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal to shift from hardcore economics to history and then from history to ocean side? Thank you. Well, I don't have too many silos in my head, as many of you may uh, know me. I have a, I have long had a, uh, in addition to my economic and finance uh, field, I have long written books on all fields of history as well. I've also written fiction. Um, so, I have worked in other fields. I have yet another field that I work in, which is on urban design. So, I have multiple fields in which I have historically worked. Uh, and so, my interest in history is really started from my interest in history. As I said, as a part of my research, I ended up finding all these uh, uh, references to stitch ships. But, uh, and then I found some stitch ships as well, uh, stitch boats that were still there. But they, you know, the people who were building them were all dying out and their uh, children were not learning this uh, shipbuilding technique. Uh, so, we, I could very right in front of my eyes see that this technique was dying out. So, I said, why not look into whether this thing can be rebuilt? After the all, I found when I went to Stockholm, the uh, Swedish have built a modern uh, Viking ship and they're sailing it around. Um, the Indonesians have built a Borobudur ship with, uh, uh, you know, uh, to resemble the one that is depicted on in Borobudur and so on. So, I said, look, we Indians seem to have severe sea blindness. You know, our entire mindset is peculiarly continental, maybe because our capital is in landlocked Delhi or whatever the reason may be. But, you know, this is strange because our history is so in linked to the ocean. India is the only country that has an ocean named after it. And yet, we don't celebrate the ocean. So, I said, look, one way to bring this back is to build one of these ships while the old tradition is still alive. In most of these other countries, when they rebuilt the ship, they had to build it from scratch because there was no living tradition. We still have a living tradition. So, when we began to do this, by the way, when Babu Sankaran, just in early September when we were doing the keel laying, his own son came. And his own son wants to do something else, didn't want to learn this uh, uh, technique. But when he saw so many people were enthusiastic about it, the, uh, uh, you know, the minister of culture had come, uh, the Navy, Navy chief had come, they were, you know, felicitating his, fa his father and so on. He got very excited and he said, no, no, I am also going to learn how to build the ship. So, in a sense, in our own little way, we have extended this... Uh, uh, tradition directly to another generation. It would have just died out. And of course, through the course of this, we are also going to document this living tradition. 
So, even if it dies out because it's not practical, etc., at least at one time we documented it. If in some future date somebody wants to build another ship, they can do so uh, because we will meticulously document it. And then this ship itself, after it has done various voyages, we intend to display it in the in the maritime museum that is now being built at Lothal. So, you know, there will be, uh, so this ship itself will be put on display. So the idea here is to, you know, document and keep it uh, before it completely dies away and then, then you know, we'll just wonder how they did it. At the outset, I should congratulate uh, Sri Sanjeev Saniel for taking up this revolutionary step. And he's following the revolutionary tradition also. Many people may not be knowing that. Okay, sir, sir, can you please uh, uh, enlighten us on that, your traditional revolution? And Mike, I, I interacted with, with one of the Uru manufacturers, the uh, manufacturers of Beipur, northern part of Kerala. And regarding the nailing and uh, stitching, that person, that expert said, his first expression was, nailing will hurt the wood. That was his expression, but then I explained, I asked for explanation. He said, uh, the nailing will create a portion in the wood that will deteriorate the quality of wood. And after maybe five or 10 years, that part will be unrepairable. So if stitching is done, there will not be any hurting to the wood. So that they, they practice stitching. And I have seen one Uru, which is 100 years old, still operating in Beipur. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, as far as uh, my own family tradition of revolutionaries, which some of you may already be aware of, uh, the reason he mentioned it is that, uh, yes, both from my mother's and father's side, uh, many members of my family were part of the revolutionary movement against the British. This is the armed resistance against uh, British rule. So uh, whether it's part of the Anushilan Samiti or the Hindustan Republican Association, and other groups. So many members of my family ended up in Kalapani or got hanged and so on uh, as part of that. So that is what he's re referring to. Uh, as far as the tradition in Bepur, yes, this is actually Babu Sankaran comes from Bepur. So he's very aware of this uh, tradition. And so, as I said, since they're no longer building these new Urus and ships, I thought, uh, let's build one while it is still alive. Uh, and it turns out his son is now interested, so maybe one more generation will keep it alive. But at least the making of this will be fully documented. We are going to do it in video and every other way. Uh, we hopefully have uh, some documentaries on this as well. So that for posterity this technique is, and maybe if someday, for whatever reason, it becomes a useful technique uh, in future, people will know what on earth was used. Uh, sir, like you brought out, uh, India has a very rich uh, maritime uh, history, sir. And as we all know, the 90% of the trade is by sea in volume, sir. However, the percentage of Indian ships carrying those trade is very less, sir. Probably uh, essentially because uh, our shipbuilding in industry is yet to uh, get back to the earlier what it was, sir. Uh, but uh, as we see with the higher, hi the largest coastline what we have, there are large number of smaller fishing vessels and trawlers being operated in the Indian Ocean, Indian waters, sir. Therefore, do we have any framework? or regulatory body, or we are looking into making one, uh, which will monitor boat construction, building, and responsible for decommissioning stroke scrapping. This would not only enhance the safety, but also uh, boost the shipbuilding industry, revive the shipbuilding industry, I, I would say, by increasing the demand, because the economy of the scale is too high, sir, and other associated industries. Your comment on that, sir. So basically what you're saying, what can we do about today's shipbuilding industry, and you're absolutely right. For a country with such a long coastline and such a lot of trade now, now that we are an emerging global power, our shipbuilding industry is actually woefully uh, underdeveloped. It's not that it doesn't exist. We do have about 27 uh, shipbuilding uh, operations, uh, which I think about one third of them are government owned and then the rest are private, uh, about two thirds is privately owned. And they do produce uh, some sophisticated ships as well, including uh, several from the Navy more recently. So it's not like we don't have the capability. However, our, you know, the sheer scale of the shipbuilding uh, activity, which as I showed you in ancient times, we had one, but this is actually existed right to the beginning of the 20th century. 
um, many of the great ships that the Royal uh, Navy was using and even many other navies or the Omanis, for example, even in the 19th century, were built actually by the uh, in Indian shipyards. Uh, uh, the Parsi community, uh, the Wadias in particular, originally made their money from shipbuilding and later on from opium, but originally from shipbuilding. So there is a tradition uh, of uh, shipbuilding that has continued more or less into the 20th century. Unfortunately, in the 20th century, it has went into somewhat into decline. Uh, for whatever reason, the first half of the 20th century, the shift from wooden hulls to steel hulls, that transition did not uh, do well for India. And it's only in the 1950s, 1960s, which we began to again re-explore uh, this. Uh, Commodore Garg was, of course, who's in memory of whom this lecture was given, it was a very important part of the sort of change in direction of that new cycle. But now the time has come to really ramp things up. I mean, we, we, we have the opportunity here because we ourselves are, uh, uh, you know, users of ships. Uh, and so the shipping ministry is looking very much into doing something about building a serious shipbuilding industry up. We have a ship breaking industry, which is quite large, but not a ship building industry. Uh, so we need to build up a ship building industry. But among the many things that need to be done, one can talk about taxes, or various other things. Uh, but in the end, I think one important thing has got to be uh, for commercial uses, not Navy, Navy has a different dynamic, but for commercial uses, we need to have ships using the Indian flag. We need much more ships using the Indian flag. We also need to think seriously about Indian ships as an export item. We have the capability, we are building very sophisticated Navy ships, so it's not like we don't know how to put ships together. Um, so this is something that it, I, I mean, I personally think need to be given a serious fillip. Um, you know, Korea, for example, which doesn't have a very big, uh, you know, it has some maritime tradition, but very small one, is today, you know, dominating shipbuilding. Uh, China, of course, itself has a has a long shipbuilding uh, industry, but again, the massive industry they're building today has been just recreated in the last 20 years. Uh, so the ancient tradition they had had basically died out. So it's only in the last 20 years that they have built it. So it is possible to um, inculcate and, and build a completely modern shipbuilding industry. And I think we need to do it uh, uh, for our economic security, for our, of course, for military security as well.